Thank you. As you've heard, I have the great good fortune to be a Dean of Osgoode Hall uh, Law School. Uh, and in that clip, my take on the Tentanda Via theme was we don't always know where uh, this journey is going to take us. But at Osgoode, we also have uh, a motto, uh, and it is Latin, but it translates as uh, through law to justice. And actually, I think the question I want to share with you, which I've been wrestling with since I came to Osgoode as a student some 24 years ago, is very much that combination. Uh, take the idea of change, of a journey, of a risk-taking path that you know uh, is going to lead you to places you can't predict, but keep your eye on the destination. That law has to lead us to justice. It's not okay to say law will take us wherever law takes us. It has to end in a place that we together feel is, uh, is doing justice. And, and that's the question uh, that has uh, bedeviled me these um, many years, uh, is how to uh, plot that path. So for example, uh, the question that, uh, uh, that I'm going to talk, uh, talk about today is, what would a court look like uh, if we conceived of it not for the judges and lawyers and professionals who inhabit it and who make it work, uh, but what if it were designed for the people who use it, for the people whose lives are affected by the justice system, touched by often the most difficult moments in their life when people find themselves caught up in litigation or criminal justice or family breakdown or uh, the many challenges which, uh, which we know uh, affect people not as legal problems but just as problems in their life for which we've come up with uh, this connection to courts and to a system of justice. Uh, so how can we think of it uh, differently? How can we chart that path uh, in a way that's going to land more firmly in what to the community, what to people in their everyday lives is going to feel like something they can have ownership of? And that's that idea of being the subject and not the object uh, of what we take justice to mean. So when I teach a course called Legal Process, it's much more fun than it sounds, uh, we start on the very first day with the gacacha tree, which um, uh, is a this tree here that you're seeing is in Rwanda, and it's not just a tree. Uh, the Gachacha idea is to create a court uh, in villages, in communities, and particularly at the most difficult moment in which to try to do justice, and that is uh, in a post-genocidal context. So following the massacres of 1994, the Rwandan justice system found itself with over 100,000 prisoners, people alleged to have done unspeakable things to their neighbors, uh, and no meaningful way to deal with all those hearings, those trials. It would take decades, and it would really be a, a context of justice delayed as justice denied. So instead, the gachacha idea was let the communities take their own back uh, and let perpetrators meet victims. Uh, and for example, if they seek an apology which is accepted, uh, then the sentence is reduced. That is a really innovative, bold, challenging idea for a justice system, that a court can be under a tree and that justice can be delivered in a way that is responsive to community. Well, here's the idea of a court we're much more familiar with. This is Osgoode Hall down at Queen and University uh, and of course a place um, where the, the law school that I'm a part of began about 124 years ago. Uh, it's still the home of the Court of Appeal, the Superior Court, it's a place where incredibly important questions are debated, whether it's same-sex marriage, is prostitution legal? When does life begin? Do we have the right to die with dignity? Do we have the right to go on strike? Uh, how are we going to manage uh, situations of great social upheaval, of poverty, of want, of mental health uh, going untreated, for example? And rather than deal with those as problems, too often in these courthouses, we see lawyers who are too expensive, engaged in legal arguments that are too abstract, in front of robed judges who are too disconnected from community, and as a result, we have no ownership of the moments that happen in this building, important as they are, and as committed, smart, and passionate as the people are who inhabit that, that building. But a court, I want to suggest to you, was never intended to be a building. It was never intended to have pillars and bricks and be cut off from the rest of our lives. So 
Uh, to use a healthcare example, too often what we're doing is worrying about how to build ambulances to get to the bottom of the cliff, which is a familiar uh, metaphor in access to justice debates. We're worried about getting that ambulance to the bottom of the cliff to pe put people back together again who've been broken by their encounter with the legal system rather than focusing on building a railing at the top so people never fall over. And if you think of that in a mental health context, we know we've got people going untreated in prisons. We know we've got situations of communities in distress without community supports, without sufficient uh, treatment programs. And we know the criminal justice system, civil justice system, that's where people end up who are themselves the embodiment of other broken systems, health care, social supports, families, etc. cetera. Uh, if we focused on preventing that fall, if we focused on healing the problems, uh, I want to suggest to you we'd have an entirely different understanding of communities and courts. And this is beginning to happen. In 2008, in Vancouver, the late uh, Chief Judge uh, Hugh Stansfield presided over the opening of the very first community court in Canada, uh, in, as I said, the uh, downtown east side. And the goal here is not just to sentence people, but to take those in the criminal justice system and look at the problem solving that each incident coming before the court in fact represents. What community supports, what treatment program, what ways of integrating someone back into a situation that can position them for success can be offered through criminal justice rather than just warehousing people who have, as I said, fallen over that uh, cliff. And this idea was in fact recommended after the 2011 uh, Stanley Cup riots. You had all these people alleged to have engaged in vandalism, theft, uh, assaults, uh, what to do with that kind of you know, huge overflow of, of people coming out of a very particular kind of community uh, breakdown. And, and again, the idea of a community court can represent that ability of going outside the building, outside the pillars and the bricks, uh, to a place where we can talk about the underlying issues that create all of the uh, reasons we know people uh, can slip through uh, those cracks. In taking that idea a step further, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Canada's innovation following the settlement of the residential schools class actions, uh, has led us to create a legal process that in fact not only doesn't have a court, doesn't have a hearing, has no evidence, isn't about giving testimony leading to judgment, but it's about coming together to share incredibly painful stories of children ripped from homes and communities, of pain, of abuse, of healing, of reconciliation. And that notion that, again, travels across the country, it's not located in a place, it's a way of approaching a national project of reconciliation, one individual painful story uh, at a time. But again, stories that end uh, with much more sense of hope and a chance to move forward together than stories that we often hear coming out of uh, our courthouses. So ultimately, uh, where does this take that courthouse story? Well, I want to suggest to you it takes us away from buildings and to people and relationships uh, in our community uh, and ways in which we can take back ownership of that journey from law to justice as I believe it was always intended to be a shared project. So OGEN, which stands for the Ontario Justice Education Network, just celebrated uh, its first 10 years and it's an enormous uh, innovation in bringing school children, judges, lawyers, academics, uh, people involved in every aspect of our justice system together to explore you know, mock trials, debates about uh, compelling legal issues. Taking these ideas out of the courtroom, into the classroom, taking people who will see each other just as objects and putting them in a position of understanding the shoes each, other's, each other might walk in, uh, which, uh, you know, assume that was uh, grammatically correct and you have the idea. Uh, and ultimately, uh, if we do that, if we put people together and see the call to action as one in which, whether it's joining peace builders, conflict resolution, legal literacy, getting involved in uh, the issues and debates that are about solving the problems that matter most to us, uh, then that really will be living not just the way that must be tried, 
but also through law to justice. Uh, and I hope to share that journey, and I hope to continue struggling with that question, uh, and I hope uh, that that is a, a way of understanding the places and the people uh, that might be a little different than you started with, just it is, as it is different than I started with uh, when I arrived um, uh, here, uh, and it feels like yesterday. Uh, but, uh, but as I said, I'm, I'm looking forward to it being a shared journey in the future. It's been a wonderful afternoon uh, for me. I'm learning a huge amount here uh, and look forward to the rest of the, uh, the shared afternoon together. Thank you very much.